The affair of the Brig Bonito was bound to cause a sensation in Macassar, the prettiest and perhaps the cleanest looking of all the towns in the islands, which, however, knows few occasions for excitement. The front, with its special population, was soon aware that something had happened. A steamer towing a sailing vessel had been observed far out to sea for some time, and when the steamer came in alone, leaving the other outside, attention was aroused. Why was that? Her masts only could be seen, with furled sails remaining in the same place to the southward, and soon the rumor ran all along the crowded seashore street that there was a ship on Tamisa Reef. That crowd interpreted the appearance correctly. Its cause was beyond their penetration, for who could associate a girl nine hundred miles away with the stranding of a ship on Tamisa Reef, or look for the remote filiation of that event in the psychology of at least three people, even if one of them, Lieutenant Heemskirk, was at that very moment passing amongst them on his way to make his verbal report. No, the minds on the front were not competent for that sort of investigation, but many hands there, brown hands, yellow hands, white hands, were raised to shade the eyes gazing out to the sea. The rumor spread quickly. Chinese shopkeepers came to their doors. More than one white merchant even rose from his desk to go to the window. After all, a ship on Tamisa was not an everyday occurrence, and presently the rumor took a more definite shape. An English trader, detained on suspicion at sea by the Neptune, Heemskirk was towing him in to test a case, and by some strange accident. Later on the name came out, the Bonito. What? Impossible. Yes, yes, the Bonito. Look, you can see from here only two masts. It's a brig. Didn't think that man would ever let himself be caught. Heemskirk's pretty smart, too. They say she's fitted out in her cabin like a gentleman's yacht. That Allen is a sort of gentleman, too. An extravagant beggar. A young man entered smartly Messrs. Messman Brothers' office on the front, bubbling with some sort of information. Oh, yes, that's the Benito for certain. But you don't know the story I've heard just now. The fellow must have been feeding that river with firearms for the last year or two. Well, it seems he has grown so reckless from long impunity that he was actually dared to sell the very ship's rifles this time. It's a fact. The rifles are not on board. What impudence! Only he didn't know that there was one of our warships on the coast. But those Englishmen are so impudent that perhaps he thought that nothing would be done to him for it. Our courts do let off these fellows all too often, on some miserable excuse or other. But at any rate, there is an end of the famous Bonito. I have just heard in the harbor office that she must have gone on at the very top of high water, and she is in ballast, too. No human power, they think, can move her from where she is. I only hope it is so. It would be fine to have the notorious Bonito stuck up there as a warning to others. Mr. James Mesman, a colonial-born Dutchman, a kind, paternal old fellow, with a clean-shaven, quite handsome face, and a head of fine iron-gray hair curling a little on his collar, did not say a word in defense of Jasper and the Benito. He rose from his armchair suddenly. His face was visibly troubled. It had so happened that once, from a business talk of ways and means, island trade, money matters, and so on, Jasper had been led to open himself to him on the subject of Freya, and the excellent man, who had known old Nelson years before, and even remembered something of Freya, was much astonished and amused 
by the unfolding of the tale. Well, 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 Nelson, yes, of course, a very honest sort of man, and a little child, with very fair hair, oh, yes, I have a distinct recollection, and so she has grown into such a fine girl, so very determined, so very, and he laughed almost boisterously. Mind, when you have happily eloped with your future wife, Captain Allen, you must come along this way, and we shall welcome her here, a little fair-headed child, I remember, I remember. It was that knowledge which had brought trouble to his face at the first news of the wreck. He took up his hat. Where are you going, Mr. Mesman? I am going to look for Alan. I think he must be ashore. Does anybody know? No one of the present knew, and Mr. Mesman went out on the front to make inquiries. The other part of the town, the part near the church and the fort, got its information in another way. The first thing disclosed to it was Jasper himself, walking rapidly as though he were pursued, and as a matter of fact, a Chinaman, obviously a sampan man, was following him at the same headlong pace. Suddenly, while passing Orange House, Jasper swerved and went in, or rather rushed in, startling Gomez, the hotel clerk, very much. But a Chinaman, beginning to make an unseemly noise at the door, claimed the immediate attention of Gomez. His grievance was that the white man, whom he had brought on shore from the gunboat, had not paid him his boat fare. He had pursued him so far, asking for it all the way, but the white man had taken no notice whatever of his just claim. Gomez satisfied the coolie with a few coppers, and then went to look for Jasper, whom he knew very well. He found him standing stiffly by a little round table. At the other end of the veranda, a few men sitting there had stopped talking and were looking at him in silence. Two billiard players, with cues in their hands, had come to the door of the billiard room and stared too. On Gomez coming up to him, Jasper raised one hand to point at his own throat. Gomez noted the somewhat soiled state of his white clothes, then took one look at his face and fled away to order the drink for which Jasper seemed to be asking. Where he wanted to go, or what purpose, where he, perhaps, only imagined himself to be going, when a sudden impulse or the sight of a familiar place had made him turn into Orange House, it is impossible to say. He was steadying himself lightly with the tips of his fingers on the little table. There were, on that veranda, two men whom he knew personally well, but his gaze roaming incessantly as though he were looking for a way of escape passed and repassed over them without a sign of recognition. They on their side, looking at him, doubted the evidence of their own eyes. It was not that his face was distorted. On the contrary, it was still, it was set. But its expression somehow was unrecognizable. Can that be him? They wondered with awe. In his head there was a wild chaos of clear thoughts, perfectly clear. It was this clearness which was so terrible in conjunction with the utter inability to lay hold of any single one of them all. He was saying to himself, or to them, steady, steady. A china boy appeared before him with a glass on a tray. He poured the drink down his throat and rushed out. His disappearance removed the spell of wonder from the beholders. One of the men jumped up and moved quickly to that side of the veranda from which almost the whole of the roadstead could be seen. At the very moment when Jasper, issuing from the door of the orange house, was passing under him in the street below, he cried to the others excitedly, That was Jasper Allen right there. But where is his brig? Jasper heard these words with extraordinary loudness. 
the heavens rang with them, as if calling him to account, for those were the very words Freya would have to use. It was an annihilating question. It struck his conscience like a thunderbolt, and brought a sudden night upon the chaos of his thoughts, even as he walked. He did not check his pace. He went on in the darkness for another three strides, and then fell. The good Mesman had to push on as far as the hospital before he found him. The doctor there talked of a slight heat stroke, nothing very much, out in three days. It must be admitted that the doctor was right. In three days, Jasper Allen came out of the hospital and became visible to the town, very visible indeed, and remained so for quite a long time, long enough to become almost one of the sights of the place, long enough to become disregarded at last, long enough for the tale of his haunting visibility to be remembered in the islands to this day. The talk on the front and Jasper's appearance in the Orange House stand at the beginning of the famous Bonito case and give a view of its two aspects, the practical and the psychological, the case for the courts and the case for compassion, that last terribly evident and yet obscure. It has, you must understand, remained obscure, even for that friend of mine who wrote me the letter mentioned in the very first lines of this narrative. He was one of those in Mr. Mesman's office, and accompanied that gentleman in his search for Jasper. His letter described to me the two aspects and some of the episodes of the case. Heemskirk's attitude was that of deep thankfulness for not having lost his own ship, and that was all. Hayes over the land was his explanation of having got so close to Tamisa Reef. He saved his ship, and for the rest he did not care. As to the fat gunner, he deposed simply that he thought at the time that he was acting for the best by letting go the tow rope, but admitted that he was greatly confused by the suddenness of the emergency. As a matter of fact, he had acted on very precise instructions from Heemskirk, to whom, through several years' service together in the East, he had become a sort of devoted henchman. What was most amazing in the detention of the Benito was his story how, proceeding to take possession of the firearms as ordered, he discovered that there were no firearms on board. All he found in the fore cabin was an empty rack for the proper number of eighteen rifles, but of the rifles themselves never a single one anywhere in the ship. The mate of the brig who looked rather ill and behaved excitedly, as though he were perhaps a lunatic, wanted him to believe that Captain Allen knew nothing of this, that it was he, the mate, who had recently sold these rifles in the dead of night to a certain person up the river. In proof of this story, he produced a bag of silver dollars and pressed it on his, the gunner's, acceptance. Then suddenly, flinging it down on the deck, he beat his own head with both fists and started heaping shocking curses upon his own soul for an ungrateful wretch, not fit to live. All this the gunner reported at once to his commanding officer. What Heemskirk intended by taking upon himself to detain the Benito is difficult to say except that he meant to bring some trouble into the life of the man favored by Freya. He had been looking at Jasper with a desire to strike that man of kisses and embraces to the earth. The question was, how could he do it without giving himself away? But the report of the gunner created a serious case enough. Yet Alan had friends and who could tell whether he wouldn't somehow succeed in wriggling out of it. The idea of simply towing the brig, so much compromised, onto the reef came to him while he was listening to the fat gunner in his cabin. There was but little risk of being disapproved now, and it should be made 
to appear an accident. Going out on board, he had gloated upon his unconscious victim, with such a sinister roll of his eyes, such a queerly pursed mouth, that Jasper could not help smiling, and the lieutenant had gone on the bridge, saying to himself, You wait, I shall spoil the taste of those sweet kisses for you, and when you hear Lieutenant Heemskirk in the future, that name won't bring a smile on your lips, I swear. You are delivered into my hands. And this possibility had come about with any pl without any planning. One could almost say naturally, as if events had mysteriously shaped themselves to fit the purposes of a dark passion. The most astute scheming could not have served Heemskirk better. It was given to him to taste a transcendental and incredible perfection of vengeance, to strike a deadly blow into that hated person's heart, and to watch him afterwards walking about with the dagger in his breast. For that is what the state of Jasper amounted to. He moved, acted, weary-eyed, keen-faced, lank and restless, with brusque movements and fierce gestures. He talked incessantly in a frenzied and fatigued voice, but within himself he knew that nothing would ever give him back the brig, just as nothing can heal a pierced heart. His soul kept quiet in the stress of love by the unflinching Freya's influence was like a still but overwound string. The shock had started it vibrating, and the string had snapped. He had waited for two years in a perfectly intoxicated confidence for a day that now would never come to a man disarmed for life by the loss of the brig, and it seemed to him made unfit for love to which he had no foothold to offer. Day after day he would traverse the length of the town, follow the coast, and reaching the point of land opposite that part of the reef on which his brig lay stranded, look steadily across the water at her beloved form, once the home of an exulting hope, and now, in her inclined, desolated immobility, towering above the lonely sea horizon, a symbol of despair. The crew had left her in due course, in her own boats, which directly they reached the town, were sequestered by the harbor authorities. The vessel, too, was sequestered, pending proceedings. But these same authorities did not take the trouble to set a guard on board, for indeed what could have moved her? Nothing, unless a miracle. Nothing, unless Jasper's eyes fastened on her tensely for hours together, as though he hoped by the mere power of vision to draw her to his breast. All this story, read in my friend's very chatty letter, dismayed me not a little, but it was really appalling to read his relation of how Schultz, the mate, went about everywhere affirming with desperate pertinacity that it was he alone who had sold the rifles. I stole them, he protested. Of course no one would believe him. My friend himself did not believe him, though he, of course, admired this self-sacrifice. But a good many people thought it was going too far to make oneself out a thief for the sake of a friend. Only it was such an obvious lie, too, that it did not matter, perhaps. I, who, in view of Schultz's psychology, knew how true that must be, admit that I was appalled. So this was how a perfidious destiny took advantage of a generous impulse, and I felt as though I were an accomplice in this perfidy, since I did, too, a certain extent encourage Jasper, yet I had warned him as well. The man seemed to have gone crazy on this point, wrote my friend. He went to Mesman with his story. He's the... He says that some rascally white man living amongst the natives 
up that river made him drunk with some gin one evening and then jeered at him for never having any money. Then he, protesting to us that he was an honest man and must be believed, described himself as being a thief whenever he took a drop too much, and told us that he went on board and passed the rifles one by one without the slightest compunction to a canoe which came alongside that night receiving ten dollars apiece for them. Next day he was ill with grief and shame, but had not the courage to confess his lapse to his benefactor. When the gunboat stopped, the brig he felt ready to die with the apprehension of the consequences, and would have died happily if he could have been able to bring the rifles back by the sacrifice of his life. He said nothing to Jasper, hoping that the brig would be released presently. When it turned out otherwise, and his captain was detained on board the gunboat, he was ready to commit suicide from despair, only he thought it his duty to live in order to let the truth be known. I am an honest man. I am an honest man, he repeated, in a voice that brought tears to our eyes. You must believe me when I tell you that I am a thief, a vile, low, cunning, sneaking thief, as soon as I've had a glass or two. Take me somewhere I may tell the truth on oath. 